أنا شاكر للجنة المنظمة ولكل من رسلني بارك الله فيكم على مجهوداتكم على هذا المؤتمر وعلى الانفيتيشن إن شاء الله اليوم ما will share with you my thoughts regarding Libya, the accreditation and the 2023. So I'm sorry if the voice is not uh, that uh, loud. In, uh, in any case, my presentation is uh, going to be based around a hypothesis and two questions. The hypothesis is that we are graduating Libyan doctors to serve our patients. So why we care about the international community? Do we really need international accreditation? And if the answer is yes, do we need to comply with 2023? And that is uh, the core of my presentation, is try to discuss those two concerns. Uh, you all know that uh, the medical knowledge is uh, becoming really extremely complex, and we see it in our practice, we see it in the literature, uh, thousands and thousands of publications on a daily basis, and, and we do see the academician, we see that the medical schools are having a hard time incorporating uh, this new knowledge uh, into the curriculum. More medical schools are being opened, especially in the last 20, 30 years, and, and there is no clear criteria for accreditation or standard even criteria. If you look at this map, you know that uh, medical schools are everywhere. <laughs> the uh, dark colors indicate uh, more than 100 medical schools in that country, and uh, the lighter uh, colors indicate less medical schools. But you can see that there are very few places that are white and they don't have medical schools. And if you look at this slide, uh, there are 10 countries uh, that have half of the medical education, half of the medical schools. So 49% of the medical schools in the world are in India, Brazil, and China, and those countries listed, you can read them for yourself. And when you uh, see the uh, growth, I put this a sketch by hand uh, uh, last night, that in, in the 1950, uh, there was not much, I think about maybe 550 medical schools because uh, the WHO, I think they published their first one in 1953 with, 100, uh, with uh, 560 medical schools. By 2009, they became 1350. And uh, by 2013, they became 2600. So you see the growth between 2002 and 10 about 14 percent and between 2009 and to, uh, 2013 34 percent growth in medical schools in the world. Now that's really tremendous and it makes it how, how can you even think of accrediting all these and of course now I believe there may be around 3,500 medical schools around the world. And all these, in reality, we suppose as educators, we're supposed to uh, transfer knowledge, transfer skills, transfer values. Uh, it's easy said than done because there are many, many factors uh, influence this. Just to mention a few, uh, there's always a balance and a fight between how much basic science you teach and how much clinical science you educate. The resources are different, whether buildings, faculty, uh, IT, finances, ratio between faculty and students and social needs, uh, social issues. Uh, uh, politics, corruption, ethics, many, many factors affecting medical education uh, and add to it uh, whether you have a, a, an organized and established healthcare system or not. So it's uh, 
quite clear that it's difficult to uh, have a single education system or to have uh, a single accreditation system that consider all these different variables. Uh, and in, in general, usually medical schools, uh, whether it's in Libya or anywhere else, lately there was a lot of uh, migration among uh, medical students and, and medical uh, doctors. But in general, they graduate doctors to serve the local market. Some of them will go abroad and come back, and some of them will go abroad and never come back. Uh, going abroad is, is really not limited to developing countries going to developed countries. No, no, going abroad is Japan, they come to the United States for further studying. Some of the United States, they get to Japan or, or South Korea for further studying in different issues. Uh, Australians come to the United States and, and so on. So it's really all over the map. And uh, USA or United States remained as the largest market for such migrating doctors. They come either for training or they come for employment. The training, we need them. It's, uh, if, you, if you look at the number of medical students graduating every year, anywhere between 19 to 20,000 students in the United States. But the number of training jobs that are available, and the training job here is part of the workforce, really. It's not just a privilege, part of the workforce about 31 to 32,000. So there is a gap anywhere 11 to 12,000 residents or trainees have to come from the international market. Some of them go back and some of them stay. So the employment in the United States is still the largest market. There 25% of the doctors in the United States come from the international market. And if you look at the for example, the Indians who leave uh, India and go abroad anywhere else, 60% of them reside and work in the United States. If you look at the F Filipino and, uh, and Chinese uh, who leave China and go practice medicine somewhere else, 70% of them, they come to the United States. So it is really a large market you cannot just ignore. And in the United States, the ESFMG or the Education Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates is the gate. That's how you can get into the training and that is how you get into the workforce in the United States. Uh, <clears throat> it started, of course, many, many uh, years ago. You have to take the exam, you get the certification, uh, as long as uh, you cannot take the exam unless your your uh, college is listed in the WHO, uh, which was started, I believe, uh, the first publish publication uh, uh, directory was in 1953. At that time, there was about 567 schools or so they were listed in the directory. This is, uh, it's probably easier to understand it here, so uh, when it comes, uh, when when the uh, international graduate comes to the United States, they have to take the assembly exams. Once they have the certificate, then they fulfilled that condition to to uh, uh, work in the United States and touch patients. And then the state medical boards is the second part of the license. The state, the here the to get the medical license to practice medicine. Each state out of the 50 states in the United States, each one has a medical board. The medical board will look at you, not from the case of the medical knowledge, because you did the exam, the qualifying exams, and you have the ECFMG certificate. But look at you from, that this guy has psychiatric problems, that this guy had a drug addiction, any uh, felony, any other problems, and so on. So if you fulfill, that is and this that state condition then you are allowed to go into clinical training 
or the workforce if you have the proper training already. And of course, it is not just a gate for employment, it's also look at the safety and the quality of, uh, so they do keep an eye on the safety of the American citizens and they keep an eye on the quality of the doctors they are getting. Uh, and they notice major changes or major variations. And that's why they came up with this new policy that we are to going to be talking about. So it took, uh, it took them many, many years of discussions and committees and it matured in 2010 with the policy to have a final implementation by 2023. So what is going to happen, the main thing is that the International Medical School Directory, the WHO Directory or any other directors are not going to be valid anymore. They are not going to be adequate for you to get the ACFMG examination and certificate. It requires that these schools are accredited. Accredited by who? The, the, the SFMG is not going to go to every school in the world, 3,000 schools, and accredit them. So they came up with the WFME or the World Federation, or the Amlil Medical Education, World Federation for Medical Education, will be the body to license Biatir Ruhsa, not to the medical schools, no, to the accrediting authorities in those countries or the countries nearby, and they put it in four phases. I don't think it's, this is just for to, to see that we are in phase two, phase one, 2010 to 2018. I think we missed it. We did not really do a lot of uh, preparation, but now I think we are taking it seriously, and I hope we will, because the WFME uh, is... Uh, is the one who are making uh, the rules on behalf of the ECFMG. It was established in 1972, and I think it's, it's in UK, and it's run by an executive council uh, with uh, members at large, and they, and they have members or representatives from the uh, World Health uh, Organization, from the World Medical Association, from the ECFMG, from the International Federation of uh, of uh, uh, medical uh, students associations. So we have room there we, where we should really be active and we should start uh, getting into those associations and, and learning what they do. The WFME uh, is really interested in basic postgraduate and professional development and wants to promote quality medical education. So it is going to be the place is going to be the one who uh, hopefully will implement the 2023 policy for the ECFMG. So they have been working hard. They already developed certain criteria at every level. And uh, uh, they considered in those criteria the safety and quality. This is the table from their website. It shows you that basic medical education, they have certain criteria, postgraduate education have certain criteria uh, uh, along the same thing uh, and the continuing professional development and the CME and so on, they have other criteria. So when, when we, we focus on the left, the basic medical education, those nine criteria, when you subclassify them into details and those probably Dr. Uh, Mustafa or Dr. Ibrahim, they probably have better experience with Dr. Afatan than me, but they, they go into about 106 points that the medical school need to fulfill. In the United States, they, they developed a body in 1942, because they do have now about 180 schools and approximately, I calculated, I think about uh, one medical school for every 1.8 million population because they are approximately 330 million. Uh, but then when it comes to the United States, they started way early. Uh, in the early 1900s, the United States have too many schools. Medical school for 
وذي نوتس انه اصبح الاطباء تجاريين والميديكال سكولز ار تو ماني والجراديوتس ار دبل ذان ذير نيدز ذا كانتري نيدز اوف فيزيشنز اند سو اون سو ذي اساينت ابراهام فليكسنر تو جو اند ايفالويت اول ميديكال سكولز ان يونايتد ستيتس اند نورث افريكا سو هي بوت ان نورث امريكا ام سوري سو ذي بوت ا تيم توجذر And they tried to, and, and they put a, a very heavy survey, looked at uh, the scientific basis of medical practice, looked at the curriculum, is it good or bad, looked at the facilities, adequate or not, faculty, so on, and looked at if there is a, a scientific or there is no scientific approach to medical education, and uh, came up with a report that still people look at it as the basis of medical education in the United States. So when the report was published, there was a greater than, I think, 160 or maybe more than 160 medical schools by 1920, 10 years later, some of them are closed because they started inspecting them down to 85. By 1935, they were down to 66 medical schools. Some of them just could not cope with the criteria. And in 1942, The American Medical Association and the uh, the AMC or the uh, uh, American Association for Medical Colleges, they put their efforts together and they created the uh, uh, Liaison Committee for Medical Education in 1942. This is the one that gives the accredita accreditation to all medical schools in the United States. And as you see, many countries started very early, you know, Malaysia, 2001, Nigeria, 1964, Pakistan, 1962, India, 1957. India, they have their Medical Council of India is the accrediting company and in, 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 uh, the, the accrediting uh, uh, center. And I believe, I'm not sure, but I believe currently they are being dissolved because of corruption and they have a lot of... Uh, a lot of problems, but I, I don't know really what have happened. In Pakistan, they did a survey. They, they looked at, can they cope with those uh, basic science criteria or, or, or uh, the standard criteria of the WFME? And they published a paper, a nice paper. Uh, it, it, so they, they, they uh, surveyed their students, graduate students and professionals. And it looks the majority of them Uh, approved and they felt they do like the WFM criteria. They very few negative things and, and one of the uh, examples for the negative things that they didn't like the idea that students are involved within the medical college and this and that and, and they felt that the students have no experience and I think probably if we do a survey in Libya we may come to very similar conclusion. Now we move to Africa Africa, we have uh, 1.3 million people, a uh, billion people in, in, uh, live in the continent. We have over uh, 230 schools, uh, basically one school for every 5.6 uh, uh, million. So, so far, we have one accreditation authority and, until probably the end of uh, 2019, and then Egypt was approved. So before Egypt was, uh, the only thing was Sudan. Sudan was one of the first 13 countries that got uh, accredited or acknowledged or certificate for accreditation center. They are up there with Turkey and United States and so on. And then Egypt got it uh, last year. When it comes to Libya, Libya is really no, uh, no, no exception in everything, you know. No exception in having many medical schools, no exception in having graduates uh, go abroad. And just, this, is, this is life. They, we are about six million people. And anywhere I have uh, different uh, numbers, but anywhere I think we have between 15 to 18 medical schools. I was told that they're operating around 16. So approximately 
even even if we take 15 only, approximately one medical school for every 400,000 individuals. Uh, this, of course, resulted in many physicians that we need, even though the, the research on these issues is really lacking. However, Dr. Ibrahim Ishbalu, Majmu'a Amin Zamalala Fadl from the Health Information and Documentation Center, they put a document, I found it very resourceful and very useful uh, because they looked at the wide spectrum of uh, data. Uh, it, it, is, it is a nice reference. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'd like to congratulate them for uh, their uh, effort. Uh, I, I bought two slides. I'm sure Dr. Mustafa, Dr. Fatin, they have updated the slides, but it shows you until last year that we still anywhere between, and these are two medical colleges. We're not talking 15. We're talking Bangladesh or Trapez. Anywhere between 22 to 30, uh, uh, one percent uh, fulfilling the WFME criteria and the standard criteria. So now, um, um, uh, as we have seen today, is uh, is much better, but but still really a long way to to uh, to get to near the 100 percent. I understand, of course, our current status with the war being um, still active. Uh, we have too many schools. Uh, we have, uh, according to the previous report, it seems uh, we have really big problem in the basic science resources, uh, professors and, uh, and equipment and everything. But I'm grateful that at least we have an accreditation agency that is uh, established and it's going to uh, to uh, work on the process. Uh, I was told that the Libyan General uh, Medical Council as an accreditation authority has been established, so it's a really a good step in the right direction. Uh, yes, it is not accredited by the WFME, but uh, hopefully we'll uh, start uh, applying soon because if they if they would not apply, they not work 24 uh, hour seven and they apply soon, we may miss the uh, target because it takes about uh, one and a half to two years for uh, the application process to be completed. Uh, if we cannot, then we may have to rely on collaborating with uh, Egypt or Sudan or uh, we need, of course, the self-assessment. You know, these, uh, the details is really better than me. I'm, I'm not telling you anything new. But what I like to emphasize to, uh, to the ministers, Mr. Lean, you know, we really need urgent offering of resources to, to the center uh, so he can, or the center can progress and can collaborate with the medical schools and deal with it. So I come to uh, the end, or very close to my end, do, uh, do we really care? Uh, I think the answer, in my opinion, yes, we do. Because we think the accreditation, we are not doing it for just the sake of the other people to say, yes, we, are, uh, we have good medical school, but it's going to be reflected on the health services in Libya too. So we're going to improve the quality and outcome of our doctors. We're going to improve the safety of our patients. Uh, we're going to improve their future employment, whether locally or abroad. And it may actually, when you have really good qualified doctors, you you, you may improve the uh, uh, your resources used and, and, and save. And of course, we will get to the international ranking, which is entirely different uh, talk outside of the scope of this presentation today, but it's really important. Uh, what I like to emphasize that everything I said is really useless if we, if, we, if we don't have the resources. It's a continuous process. It's not just a snapshot. You do it today and then you sleep comfortably and you relax. No, 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 it's, it's going to be a continuous process. 
you assessment, you do improvement, you assess again, reevaluate again, improvement, and so on. This is a continuous process. That's how you advance. And the resources for the accreditation center or the colleges, they need the qualified staff, they need the training, they need to visit other places, collaborate with other places, they need the freedom of contracting. So they need a good budget for that. Uh, uh, and and that is something where you you cannot be really greedy or stingy. Then things will not work. Now uh, I think this is probably the last slide. Having said all this, there is a nice article written and published in uh, Academic Medicine 2019 by Sean Tackett. Uh, it goes through the policy in details and the predictions and. And it looks about one third of the uh, of the countries is still non-compliant with the WFM criteria, and they don't even have accreditation yet. So it's it's probably going to be a problem. Uh, what will be the impact on the international residents in USA? I really don't know. Do the CFMG and the WFME are going to change their? Uh, mind and come up, modify the policy or extend the years, we don't know. But I think we should continue working hard, trying our best to comply with the with the 2023 or at least the majority. I mean, if we make it to 60% and we see a trend, that, that will help, you know. Uh, these are uh, references for more reading if anybody is interested in reading more about the topic. And I want to thank you so much again for uh, inviting me. I really appreciated it. And uh, I wish you uh, the best and uh, thank you.